All right, let's go to our passage for this morning. If you do have a Bible, please turn to Philippians again. There's two more messages in this series, Philippians chapter 4. We are going to be concentrating on verses 10 to 13. So, we have a Bible, go ahead, open it up. I'm going to be reading in the NIV. Right in front of you, if you don't have a Bible, is one in the pew, and you're going to be on page 1013. So, if that's going to be helpful for you, you can, you can do that. And also, if you want notes, okay, sometimes we cover a lot of stuff, you're not going to remember everything, right? And so, hopefully, that could be of help to you as well. If you're online, there will be notes or should be notes there in the chat room or on our website. You can just navigate over there, download those, and have them in front of you. So, today's passage is another iconic passage. It is often quoted and sometimes tragically misapplied. But it's an important, again, passage as Paul is in this part of Philippians where he's rapid firing us, telling us, now apply these things. And so there's deep theology and practical help in what we're seeing. And so here we are, Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read this, these verses in their entirety, and of course, we're going to come back and take a look at them. So let's read this. Paul says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Now indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Now, I, I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Now, I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. Now, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength, right? This is profound, right? This is unbelievable, and it is also accessible to us. Now, if we remember, Paul is saying these things from his luxurious penthouse suite on the hundredth floor of a building overlooking scenic views. He's not saying that. He's saying that in a place, or saying this in a place that is quite opposite for that. Here is this man of God, okay, serving the Lord, sacrificing for the Lord, traveling, putting himself in peril in all types of places because of his love of Christ and his calling and love for people. He finds himself in a, a cell, primarily isolated and in desperate need. And this church in a place called Philippi sent an embassy, an ambassador with help. And Paul is instructing them and instructing us. Paul is encouraging them and encouraging us. Paul is thanking them for the help. And so he talks about something that is just incredible about being content. And I have some good news and bad news about that, right? The good news is that you can be content. And the good news is that contentment doesn't come from your abundance or lack of stuff. Right? This is good news. It's good that God also gives us access and desires for us to be content. Now, adding to that good news and more good news, there's also more good news that happens to be bad news because everyone in the world wants you to be content as well, and they have exactly what you need to do that, right? A new beverage, a new experience, a new car, right? Or a better house, or a better spouse, right? 
or better clothing, or just a little bit more, right? And if you have this truck, you will feel like a man, right? <laughs> if you have this vacation, you then will be content. Advertisers use this desire to get you to buy the stuff, get the thing, and then, then you will be content. We are bombarded by these messages everywhere. And what we read from God Himself is in stark contrast to those messages is this message. Paul says, I have learned to be content. And he tells us how. And so the good news is we're all in school, right? And the school of learning to be content. Some of us are still in preschool, right? Other of us in this room, you're in graduate school because you have learned this as well. So I'm going to point us towards, I believe, hopefully three helpful things in this passage that will help you and I, help us to be content now, today, without adding one thing more. And that is a huge promise. So, in order to unpack some of these things, I think we do need to define what contentment means. The dictionary definition of contentment is this, okay? That is being satisfied with what one is or has, not wanting more or anything else. It's a pretty good definition. Satisfied with what one is or has and not wanting anything more or else. The word in Greek that we're looking at in this passage, Greek being the original language of the New Testament, also means knowing you have all you need for your circumstances. That's pretty key. To be self-sufficient, to be self-ruled, or self-contained, okay? I hope that helps us in understanding what that means. Now, the truth is, and we just read it in the passage, and we'll look at it um, a little more here, that our circumstances can either be pretty big Okay, or they can be extremely small. Okay, you could have next to nothing. Okay, have a very small um, uh, circle of contentment and still be content. Or that circle can be quite expanded, and even in that expanded more pleasant, so to speak, circumstances, you can still be content. So it's not the size of your house or the condition or brand of your clothing or of your car or your location that will provide contentment. So please don't buy, buy the, what is advertised that this thing or that place or that person if I just have it, I'll be content. That is a lie, right? Paul says, hey, you know what? I've had tons of stuff. And he says, you know what? I've had hardly anything, and I know what it is to be in need. When we become disconnect, and that's, uh, <laughs> look at my graphic artist skills. Do you love these? I looked at this, and I'm like, oh, Lord, I have a zero future in graphic design. Okay, this is the best I can do, okay? But it helps me visually, okay? So contentment is living within your circumstances, okay? Discontentment, regardless of your circumstances, is trying to live beyond those circumstances, right? 
I want, if I just had, right? If I just could grasp. And so the difference between you living within your circumstances and situation, within your budget or within your marriage covenant, right? Okay, this, this, this circle is pretty powerful. If you say, well, I just want to go a little beyond because I really need that person, experience, thing, and I have to have it, then we grow in our discontent living outside of our circumstances. God helps us. This word helps us. How then can we do this thing? How can I live regardless of if you're sitting on a, a hard pew or a soft chair, right? How can I be self-sufficient, content, contained, satisfied, at peace? Because ultimately, this is what we want. So let's look at this passage a little closer to understand what will help us to be content because the promise is that we can be if we learn to be. So what then do we and must we learn? The number one thing in this passage I want to suggest to us is to rest in God's sovereignty. Okay? To rest in that. Now, it was interesting to me, and maybe you thought it was a little odd, in um, verse 10 of this passage where Paul says, I greatly, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you renewed your concern for me. Shouldn't Paul have said, Thank you so much for giving me this stuff. I was desperately in need, and I thank you for this stuff. Now, in one sense, of course, he is thanking them. But Paul does understand that their renewed concern for, for him was ultimately a reflection of God's love for him. Because right before this, and if you remember a couple of verses up, that we're told to pray, right? Don't be anxious about anything, but in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to God, and then the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Do you remember that, right? So Paul lives what he writes and lives these things, and so surely he was praying to God, because his food supply was dwindling fast. He wondered, did anyone and does anyone remember my plight? And so he talked to God who hears our prayers. And when this person, Epaphroditus in this case, came, he thanked God for his answering of prayers. God's sovereignty in some circles gets a bad rap, and we struggle with God's sovereignty and also our choices. How do these intersect? How do these work together? Well, I want to assure you that they do. God is sovereign. And we are responsible also for our choices. These things are there. So this is where resting in God's sovereignty helps us. Recognizing what we have ultimately is from the Lord. Do you know this passage in Romans, right? It says this, and this is extremely helpful. In one of perhaps my favorite chapters of the Bible, he says this, for that those who love God, this is Paul talking, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, right? This should help us 
Because God's ultimate goal is to conform you into the image of His Son. This is verse 29. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined for what? To be conformed into the image of His Son in order that He or she might be, uh, He, that's Christ, may be the firstborn among many brothers. What this tells us is that God's ultimate goal is to conform us to look like Jesus, okay? That's what he's calling you to, right? Which means that the various things of your life, the good things, the not so good things, the kind of good things, and even the horrible stuff, God uses these things to conform us into the image of God, resting in God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty helps you not to fret about things. Now, there's things that I would like or delight in, some preferences of mine, but I trust God who takes care of me and gives me everything I need for life and godliness. Thank you, Apostle Peter. Right? This comes into play in, in my life for situations in which, for say, we go to Kenya for a missions trip. I want to bring everyone that I can. But I pray this. I say, God, will you bring the people and will you provide the f- finances that we need? I pray this for them. And guess what? If a group of 12 turns into a group of four, I trust in God's sovereignty. That's exactly who we want it to be. And when the finances come in, I thank God for that through the um, lives and support of people that God is providing what is needed in God's sovereignty. I'm not there wishing, oh, this person, that person. God, you know exactly who needs to be on this trip. So I don't fret about it, right? I'm encouraging you to pray. And in that prayer rest. Now, does God answer every prayer of yours in the way that you think he should? (laughs) You guys have prayed as well, okay, right? He doesn't. Do you trust that God is a good father and wants what is best for you, just like any good parent for their kids. They don't give the kid everything they want because we'd be having campouts and sleeping in or sleeping till uh, noon and, and drinking Coke all day and eating cotton candy forever, right? Good parents know what's best for the child. Because they know the child. God is a thousand times better than any good parent that you have and knows you a thousand times better perfectly, actually. And gives us what we need. Some of you need to work in resting in sovereignty of God. And there's lots of verses, lots of passages there. Talked to our friend Job. You remember Job? Talked to Job. Recently, I've just read that book, spent a lot of time in it as I was going through a class. Job never questioned God's sovereignty. He just wanted to know why. But he never questioned God nor accused God of all that took place. We knew the end of the story. He did not when he was living it. Trusting, better yet, resting in God's sovereignty will help you regardless of the circumstances. Did you pray? Did you ask God? It's okay. Paul learned this. You and I can learn to rest in His sovereignty. I rejoice greatly in the Lord. Paul knew where these gifts or these gifts were coming from. That brings us to the second point. Rejoice in God's 
gifts. Right? And the gifts are a little different, by the way, than what you perhaps think. Again, going back to verse 10, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that you have renewed your concern for me, that the Philippian church's concern, that is, love for Paul, was renewed. And he thanked God for that as he's writing to them. And he says, indeed, you were concerned, right? You had this concern, but you didn't have an opportunity to show it. But now that you had an opportunity, this is a beautiful thing. And then he goes on to say, well, I am not saying this because I am in need. And we're going to stop right there. Paul indeed was in need, right? He had desperate needs. And as we continue to look down, you'll see needs in there. And he says, may God supply all of your needs. So he's not saying that he did not have needs. Okay, there's a double negative, right? He's saying, I have needs, but I'm not thanking you and thanking God that you fulfilled my needs. I'm not thanking you primarily for the goods and the money. I'm thanking God that you're concerned for me. Did you catch that? Okay. He's thanking God that other people, <laughs> people say, I know you're going to fall off the stair one day. <laughs> I didn't. I was close. Okay. He's thanking God that people actually love him. Now, when we give money or spend time or give words of encouragement or all of these things that we can do to show love to each other, those things are precious. But they're the result of something more precious, which is love, right? Amen. These things remain after everything is going to be gone. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And love is from God. Right? So when anyone expresses love to you, you can praise God and thank them for their love, not just for the thing. Because no one wants to be an ATM for other people. Now, perhaps in times you've felt that way, that the only reason that people want to interact with you is because they want something from you. Is that a good feeling? No, right? No one wants to have a transactional relationship only, right? If you have children, you don't want your kids just to come to you when they need a little something. Right? And you laugh because you know what I'm talking about, right? Right? gets old after a while. The best thing is the love. I love you. And because I love you, I will express it in this way. And sometimes we don't have the means to do it. And it's not the stuff that matters. It's the relationship that matters. It's the concern that matters. It's the connection that matters. It's the love that matters most, because in the end, all the stuff goes away. But what it can be is an, a, it's a token of love. Right? So Paul isn't saying, oh, thank you, Philippians, because I was going to die, now I'm not. And by the way, I like pastrami a little bit better than this. So next time, do a little better. And please, 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 please help me. Right? Paul's saying, hey, I'm not thanking you because... I didn't have needs. I do have needs. Right? And then he says, let me tell you about these needs. So he is thanking them for gifts. This helps him be content. And the gift is the love of God seen in the lives of people. I'm going to tell you this right now. You have people who love you. Well, I don't feel like it. Well, you have to talk to yourself. Self, let's talk about this a little bit. This is why being part of a body is important, why relationships are important. Right? You have love to give and you have the capacity because God made you in his image to receive love. Doing these things help bring contentment. Okay. This is a gift. 
Paul knew that he is loved by God and loved by others, regardless of how much stuff he had or didn't have. Right? That's good news. So I want you to think about, when you think about the gifts of God, I expand that way beyond where you live or what you drive. Expand that into the thing that matters most, that you are cared for and that you are loved. And this love is from God. So what helps us to be content is, number one, resting in God's sovereignty. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more in just a second how we get help to do this. Second is to rejoice in God's gifts. Remind yourself of these things. It will help you be content. The third is this, that we are to rely on Christ's strength. Rely on Christ's strength. So let's return back to the passage. Let's take a look at this. So he thanks them. He rejoices greatly, and they renewed their concern for him. He does have need, but he says, hey, 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 I want to let you know this. Verse 11, the second part of that verse, where he says, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And he goes on to explain. <laughs> I know what it is to have need, and so we do. I know what it has to have plenty I've learned the secret and underline this to be content in any and every circumstance, right? Ooh. Well fed, hungry, plenty, poverty. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And I'm glad that the NIV translated that way. I can do all this. If you see that, then it'll make you understand, well, what's the this he's talking about? That's being content regardless of what he has. Other versions say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so then we take that phrase, and then we put it on a t-shirt, and we give it to kids and say, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Dunk a basketball. And they don't because they're four feet tall. <laughs> Christ has let me down. No, you misapplied that verse. Okay? What this verse is talking about, this is why context matters. <laughs> Thank you. It matters. What it's talking about is having the strength to be content if you live in a minivan or you live in a mansion, right? I can have the strength to be content regardless of my circumstances. Now, both of these ditches have their own temptation. I know people who have a ton of stuff and a ton of money. Like multi, multi, multi millionaires. I know personally and up close. More stuff doesn't bring more contentment. Because, hey, you start out with a Taurus and then you move up all the way to a Maserati. And then, oh, there's a nicer one and there's a bigger one. You get a boat, you want a bigger boat. You get a beach property. You want a better beach, beach property. You're going in coach, now to first class, and first class isn't enough, so now you want a private jet. Right? You understand how this works? You can sit at a meal, and I have sat at a table where the meal itself, for the ten of us, costs about three grand for a meal. How that gets into your soul is, you're like, oh, it'd be so nice if I could have my own personal chef. <laughs> and then when you go home to your ramen noodles or your Rice Krispies, you're like, <laughs> my life is horrible. <laughs> is it? Do you have enough? You see how the ditch of having lots of stuff you, people there still 
live outside of their circumstances, outside of their means. You know, people who make $2 million a year and spend $2.5 million a year, right? trying to get contentment from stuff never happens. Paul says, you know what? I've learned to be content if I'm, uh, if I'm sleeping in a very nice place. And Paul did, right? I'm content. He's not sitting there saying, oh, I wish I had this. Oh, I'm jealous of that. Oh, you know what I'm saying? You, know, you, guys, you guys know what I'm saying here? I don't want to beat, beat this to death. But that can be a trap stuff. Now, on the other hand, it makes more sense to us, right? Not having stuff can be a trap as well. Because you're always thinking of, well, I need something more. I need something more. I need something more. Paul says, hey, you know what? I've slept on king pillow top mattresses and I've slept in prisons with chains. It's not my circumstances that dictate my contentment. It's Christ, right? Who gives me strength. Well, what is this strength, right? What is this strength? And haven't you ever felt it or thought it a little bit odd when you read about um, the fruit of the Spirit, right? This is in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is, and we probably know this, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and self-control. Did you ever notice that? Wait a second. Isn't I, aren't I the one who controls myself? Why is this a gift of, excuse me, or a fruit of the Spirit? Right? Have you ever thought about that? I've thought about that. That's a little odd, right? Why is it? <laughs> well, this is why the power or strength to control yourself is a fruit of the Spirit. It's because the Spirit helps you to live within your container of your circumstance. When you go outside the lines and say, I want this, I need that, I have to have this, because if I have this, or I do this, or I be this, then I'll be content. And you, bl- you believe that lie, you will never be content, ever. If you're trying to live outside of your circumstance, your commitment, your budget, whatever it is, you're trying to do this, and then you think you'll be content. And, once, and if you reach that, then you'll find out you're not going to be because contentment doesn't come from your circumstance. Your contentment comes from the power of Christ in you right? to help you to control yourself. So if you're sitting at a meal that costs $3,000, you can praise God and not every night thereafter long for that meal again. You can thank God for it and be okay. And if you're sitting there with your rice and your lentils, which I have done as well, the whole meal doesn't cost more than a quarter and there's not enough, you can be content in that as well. Because God gives you the strength to make you content to live inside of your circumstances, not beyond it. That's real help. Paul says, I can be self-sufficient because I'm connected to the all-sufficient one. It's not because I'm so great, but because Christ is so good and He gives me the strength to live within my situation and circumstance, and it's good. That's powerful. That's profound. Now, if you're sitting here and you know that your discontentment level is pretty high, (laughs) this is the application for you. One, Am I and can I rest in God's sovereignty, His goodness for you? This will help you, regardless of the size of your TV screen or the number of cable channels or how fast your internet is. God, I trust you. I'll rest in If you say, you know what, I have a ton of stuff, but everybody wants my 
my stuff, and people who have a lot of stuff struggle with this because they think people just want to be with them because of what they can give them versus who they are. That's an issue. You can thank God for the gift of love and give love and look for what God is doing around you, and you can rejoice in that. And then thirdly, hey, let's rely on Christ's strength. Strength to be okay when your car doesn't have air conditioning on a 95-degree day. Strength to be okay if you're driving away with a really nice car and you're okay. That's profound. And then you can interact with the world, you can interact with people out of strength that is beyond yours, out of love that is beyond yours, and in peace that is beyond yours because you trust in God's goodness. Outside of these things, and there's other things in the text here, talking about is difficult, wanting the desire for more, you hurt yourself. Keep yourself, this is the first Timothy 6, by the way, you can keep yourself away from ruin and destruction for harmful desires that always want more. If you're looking for contentment, more won't get it. Christ will. Christ will bring it to you. So this is my hope for you. This is my hope for us. We can rest. We can rejoice. We can rely on the strength of Christ. Expressing love. Resting in God's goodness regardless. Trusting that we'll have all that we need. So I'm going to get done early today. And the children's workers are like, yay, first time ever. (laughs) I usually go really long. (laughs) But they were not, right? So I want to give us some time to reflect on this, right? And so if (laughs) Rob's probably like, what? How is he done? Here he is. So proud of myself. Good job, Dave. Here he comes, like, I can't be. But I want, to, want you to, I'm just going to ask you to do a little business with your own soul. Okay. Do a little business with the Lord today. Right? Okay. What are you relying on for your contentment? Are you content? How can you be content? How can you learn this stuff? Being content is a much better place to be. And so I'm going to pray for us. We're going to sing. And if you say, hey, you know what? I need some more time of prayer. I'm just going to be silent for a little bit. And you may need to spend time in extended prayer. Not just today, but perhaps tonight or this week. I want you to think about this passage. God, can you help me to learn these things? God, help me to know what is true and move forward. So, God, we do thank you for your words today. God, I'm grateful for uh, friends in here today. God, I'm grateful that you brought us here today because we prayed and you're answering. God, you know the state of every person's mind and heart. God, you know the extent of their circumstances. God, you know our situation. And Jesus, you provide us by your Spirit the strength we need to be content. Father, I especially pray for people today who struggle with this. And it shows by their frantic lifestyle or their overspending or their just sour attitude of being discontent with whatever. God, will you do a miracle today in our hearts? God, a miracle. 
you help us to understand these things and to be a people who are content. And through that, Lord, will you glorify yourself and we thank you for your good gifts that you give. In Jesus' name, amen.